ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. As Speaker of the House, it is my official and personal honor to welcome friends of Speaker John Boehner to the U.S. Capitol on this historic day. The presence of members from both sides of the aisle, from both sides of the Capitol, uh, is a testament to the respect that all have for John, Mr. Speaker. We are pleased to welcome two former speakers. We anticipate Speaker Gingrich, who is with us, and Speaker Ryan. Both of them are here. <laughs> and we warmly welcome and extend our gratitude to Debbie, to Lindsay, and Tricia, and the entire Boehner family for sharing John with this Congress and with our country. Now it is my privilege to invite Father Conroy to deliver the invocation. Father Conroy. surrounded by quadraphonic speakers. <laughs> Dear God, we give you thanks for the proceedings of this day and for Speaker John Boehner and his place in history as the 53rd Speaker of the People's House. We thank you for his many years of faithful attention to the People's House as its speaker. Our nation will always be grateful for his leadership and aware of the important contribution Speaker Boehner made to the greatness of our nation. Bless our time here together on this joyous occasion. In the course of these ceremonies, may all be reminded of our shared citizenship and the importance of public service in the advancement of our experiment of constitutional democracy. May all that is said and done here be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of the colors of the United States by the U.S. Capitol Police Ceremonial Unit and the singing of our national anthem by Master Sergeant Robert Berner and the retiring of the colors. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glow Bursting in there, gay through, through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Kevin McCarthy, Republican Leader of the United States House of Representatives. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. With all the turmoil going in Washington, John Brainer brought us all back together. Before I begin, I want to say a special thanks to John's wife, Debbie, and to his children and grandchildren. I spent many hours with your father, and sometimes it was a smoke-filled room. <laughs> but he always spoke of you. He always spoke of you. From the earliest days, the Capitol building has showcased America's values through art. Today, we add another painting to its treasured gallery, one that represents our values of hard work and gratitude. Few individuals embody these values more than John. Think for a moment of the American dream. A young boy growing up with 11 siblings and sweeping the floors of his dad's bar. Nothing prepared him more for the job of being speaker than John Boehner. In Congress, John served in several leadership roles and as committee chair. In modern history, he was among the best prepared in history to be elected to become speaker. And his preparation served John well and our country. History will be very kind to this man. From the time John received that gavel, from then former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, until this year when I had to return the gavel, because of John's leadership, the federal government was spending less in discretionary than it was when John was first handed the gavel. Now, I don't know if that will ever happen again. It has already been broken. John also secured new educational opportunities through charter schools, underprivileged children in D.C. and across the country. And John showed his love for freedom by commissioning the Freedom Foyer for the Capitol, which includes the bust of William Churchill. He did these things all while bringing new groups of members into the Republican Conference and skillfully managing the diverse views and personalities. You know who they are. I saw this firsthand when we worked together to earn the trust of the American people to lead Congress. I spent a lot of time with John, and I will always be grateful for the opportunities he gave me. I met John the very first time as a young staffer when he was, um, he was on the Oversight Committee in Lumberton, North Carolina, in a contested election, and we became friends. When I first got elected to Congress as a freshman, I remember John calling me into his office when he was minority leader, and he wanted to offer me the job of being the platform committee chair that year. I remember turning to him and asking him, did I do something wrong? <laughs> he gave me a day to think about it, and I took the job. Then when he called me back and asked, said, we're going to win the majority, but I want to work with you, and I want to develop a project that would actually make a pledge to America and what we promised we would do and what we would carry out. John was right. America was hungry for that. See, I remember taking John to the very first Tea Party rally. It happened on tax day on April 15th. John heard something that others were not hearing across this country. And he wanted to make a pledge that we would govern differently. He was right. We captured 63 seats that year, and John became the Speaker of the House. If you look at this career, there's a lot of victories, and there are some stumbles. Our life is like a book, and there are times in a chapter when we stumble that that may be the end of that chapter. There's many that would have left or retired during through some of the struggles that John endured. You never seen him complain. He always had that smile on his face. And he endured, and he rose to occasion that many did not think possible, to recapture the House, but not just for a party, but for a republic and a country. And I applaud you for the work you have done. In John's case of what I learned in all those days of being Speaker, and some were tough, John has the patience of Job. For Job, that meant suffering and yet never cursing God or losing faith in him. In John's case, that suffering was guiding our party and country in a new direction. 
But John never lost his faith in God, his country, or his party. Along the way, there have been a few tears. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Whenever you saw the tears on his face, he was usually talking about children of freedom because he cared deeply about their future and about ours. John put his heart and soul in preserving the American dream, particularly through education. He wanted everyone to have the opportunities that a good education creates. Now we will add the portrait to the gallery of speakers. Many people will pass by it, but what will it tell us? Well, a portrait lasts a long time, but a legacy of change lasts far longer. In fact, it grows from generation to generation. It's like compounding interest or a snowball rolling down a hill. John, your legacy is right here in the people's house. This portrait is more than a tribute to one man. It's an internal reminder of the values he stood for. Freedom, hard work, and never quitting. Those are the same qualities that Theodore Roosevelt spoke of in this famous man in the arena, and John lived up to them. The portrait speaks to us as clearly as when John would speak to us from the floor of the house. It is the same message we would hear when he would comment about maybe our crooked tie, our wrinkled suit jacket. It is the same message that serving in this institution is a privilege. Representing the people is the most sacred responsibility an American can have. John took pride in how he appeared before the American public because he took pride in them. He was proud to be their representative and he showed it, he understood it, the responsibilities that it entailed. This is what I hear when I'll walk by this portrait and I'll take pride in knowing with American people of what John stood for. I know John doesn't put much stake in fanfare. If you ask him, he never wanted this day to come. He did not care about a portrait. His approach was always to get to the point quickly and emphasize it strongly. Like President Lincoln at Gettysburg. John could be brief, but make a big impact on people's lives. And for all of John's great accomplishments, from funding, from opening up and changing the VA, from transforming a country and listening to a voice others would not, there are some small things that still live on, like the Boehner birthday song. <laughs> Fittingly, you may know that last Sunday was John's 70th birthday. So I would like to end with you joining with me in singing to John his birthday song, The Boehner Way. This is your birthday song. It doesn't last too long. Hey! I just, I know your portrait and I know your legacy will last generations. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Charles E. Schumer, Democratic Leader of the United States Senate. Well, when you're chairman of the Rules Committee in the Senate, as I was in 2012, you have the responsibility of planning the presidential inauguration and all the associated festivities, including the congressional luncheon, an honor, but also a laborious task. Without naming any names, several dignitaries had particular preferences about where they like to sit, when they like to speak, and how exactly they'd like their food prepared. When I asked Speaker Boehner what he wanted for lunch, he replied, I'm one of 12 children, doesn't even need to be warm. <laughs> <clears throat> Despite rising to one of the highest offices in our country, John Boehner never forgot where he came from, and he carried that modesty and sense of perspective with him. Even the Speaker of the House can sing zippity doo -dah at a press conference. <laughs> As many of my colleagues noted, John wore his emotions on his sleeve. He sometimes got overwhelmed, and not always at the times you'd expect. A Politico headline once wondered, why does John Boehner cry so much before listing a series of mysterious, misty-eyed moments for the Speaker? listening to Irish music on St. Patrick's Day, during the rendition of America the Beautiful, after a tribute to golf legend Arnold Palmer. 
Now, I have some regret that John left the political scene when he did. If he had only endured a few more years, I never would have become crying Chuck Schumer. The president labeled me, initially it was this just parenthetical, fake tears Schumer, because I was weepy when we were, we had a bunch of immigrants who were being, their families were being split up, I was on stage, and I was teary-eyed, and Trump said, I know Schumer, those are fake tears, he never cries. Well, actually, I share crying with John Boehner. It's, no, it's well known in my family when I took my daughter's four and eight to see Free Willy. I started weeping uncontrollably when Willie escaped and got into the ocean. My daughters ran out of the theater. They never saw. So we have that in common as well. I'm not going to say Speaker Boehner and I agreed on most of the issues, or even many. Immigration comes to mind. But he always exercised humility, a sense of humor. He always understood the nature of compromise. He knew that in a divided government, you don't get 100% of what you want all the time. Sometimes he knew you don't even get what you want from your own side of the aisle. It's not hard to understand John's love of cigarettes, red wine, and the occasional serenity prayer. Now, I believe as if his interest in legalizing marijuana had started earlier, he might have enjoyed an even more relaxing speakership. <laughs> He's an easy subject, you know, <laughs> in all seriousness. Speaker Boehner was always a good, a decent man. He worked to guide the House under the most difficult of circumstances. We thank him for his service, and we are glad to see that he is so enjoying the next chapter in his life. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mitch McConnell, Majority Leader of the United States Senate. Well, it's great to be here today with all of you for this wonderful occasion. I've been hard pressed uh, to think what words of tribute could possibly be meaningful to a stone cold stoic like John Boehner. In situations like this, you could imagine some honorees may be getting a little emotional, maybe a little choked up, but not John, not somebody so unemotional, so completely unflappable. You could set aside all of John's other accomplishments and he'd still deserve to be remembered forever as the best deal maker and negotiator with the worst poker face in American political history. Yes, uh, Speaker Boehner has always worn his heart right on his sleeve. I think it's actually one of the biggest reasons why he earned so much respect and affection throughout his career, even from those who strongly disagreed with him. We all remember John arrived back in 1991 as a hard-charging young conservative. He and six other freshmen decided to endear themselves to the old guard by immediately calling out the House banking scandal. And John kept right on shaking things up and speaking his mind for a quarter of a century. He fought for reforms, he helped shape and lead his conference, and he served the American people as Speaker of the House, steering the institution through a turbulent time with patriotism, principle, and graciousness. I'll never forget how John once explained the job of speaker for the press. Here's what he said. I grew up in a bar, mopped floors, did dishes, tended bar. You had to learn with, to deal with every character that comes in the place. And trust me, I need all the lessons I learned growing up to do this job. <laughs> That's the John Boehner magic. With John, you have the red wine, the Trattoria, 
the smokes, the golf. In some ways, it's almost like a caricature of a powerful leader come to life, walk right off the page of some political cartoon. But you also have this remarkably forthright, good-hearted, and genuine person, one of the most down-to-earth individuals this town has ever seen. Many have observed that John embodies the American dream. As others have said, one of 12 kids living in a one-bedroom house and wiping down a bar in a factory town grows up to walk the corridors of power and actually gets his portrait hung right here in the U.S. Capitol. But that isn't the whole story. The story is not just that John climbed from a humble start to wield all this power. The real reason why John has lived the American dream is how he used that power, working every day to help other children write new stories of their own. John knew in his bones he was Speaker of the House for a reason. John knew he was Speaker because small factory towns don't fight for themselves, and inner city school children who need school choice don't fight for themselves, and the American idea doesn't fight for itself. All of them need champions, and in you, Mr. Speaker, they all had one. Congratulations on this historic honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Good afternoon again. Speaker Boehner is a great patriot who has dedicated his life to our country. It is only fitting that we celebrate his legacy here in Statuary Hall, this pantheon of American patriots, where great Americans are immortalized in marble and bronze. Now, John's portrait will be join his predecessors in the speaker's lobby as an inspiring, enduring monument to his contributions to our country. Now, I was just trying to think of occasions when I saw John climb, and then I was thinking of occasions when I didn't see John climb. But I think he was crying when he gave me the gavel as Speaker of the House. <laughs> Being the first woman Speaker and all, it was emotional, wasn't it, John? <laughs> In John's farewell speech on the House floor, he said, the People's House is the great embodiment of the American dream. All of the speakers have addressed that aspect of John's life, of the speaker's life. How appropriate that John served the Speaker of the House because John is the personification of the American dream. In his story, we were reminded of the promise of, Amer the promise of America, that a hard-working son of an Ohio barman can rise to be Speaker of the House. As Speaker, John was a formidable spokesperson for his party and for his cause. He sought common ground where he could, held his ground where he could not. He always stood the, under, the value of relationships and consensus building. He, he always was about something I advised other members to be. He was always a person of his word and friendship never left his voice in all of our negotiations. We will never forget how he worked with Ted Kennedy and George Miller, two liberal lions, under the leadership of President George W. Bush, to pass landmark education legislation. We all had our differences, but I remember I respected his commitment to America and to this institution. We all remember how John made the visit of Pope Francis such a meaningful and beautiful experience for all of us, don't we, Alistair? <laughs> and how wonderful today to see young Alistair here with Zachary, who was just, Alistair was just six weeks old when he was blessed by the Pope, His Holiness the Pope. That day, with absolute clarity, beauty, and moral urgency, Pope Francis called on us to, to be better stewards of God's creation and to be instruments of God's peace. John had that clarity, too, in everything he did. Thanks to John's leadership, the Holy Father's message of hope, peace, and dialogue will be a blessing and inspiration to our Congress and the country for many years to come. In his farewell speech, 
well, not quite farewell because we have another one now, but in that up-to-date uh, farewell speech, John also spoke of the namesake of his home city, the great Roman general Cincinnatus, a farmer who answered the call of his nation to leave and then surrendered his power to return to the home he loved. John, the Congress and the country have been strengthened by your decision to answer the call of our nation when you did. And now we wish you all the best as you enjoy your retirement. I don't know if that's quite the word for it. Now I have the privilege of inviting uh, to the podium here, Speaker Banner's family to join in the unveiling of his portrait. And Deborah, Debbie, thank you so much. And Alistair and Zachary are going to be joining us as well. The future, the future. Here they come. Let us welcome the family to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable John A. Boehner, 53rd Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, well, well. What a lovely day to be back in the Capitol. I see Madam Speaker took care of me. She put a box of tissues uh, down here just in case, which is, I don't know, we'll see how I do. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, thank you for uh, hosting this event today. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues that I served in the leadership with and, and uh, our distinguished guests, friends, and family. Uh, let me just say thanks to all of you for being here today. Let me thank my family, Deb, Lindsay, Tricia, uh, Jake, Dominic, Alistair, and Zach uh, for being here and, uh, and being supportive throughout all these years. Uh, let me thank R.D. and Joan Dale Hubbard uh, for the generosity that made this portrait a reality. And, they can't be here today, but I can't thank them enough. Uh, let me also thank uh, the artist, uh, Ron Shear, who did a great job. Uh, Ron's work can be found in places like the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, he's done work for some of our nation's top officials, including some of our past presidents. Now, you may be aware that uh, one of our past presidents, my friend, 43, George W. Bush, also painted a portrait of me. For the record, that is a different portrait than this one. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
that one won't be hanging in the, uh, in the speaker's lobby, but does hang in our living room in our home in Ohio. And uh, I think Debbie and I want to send our thanks uh, to President Bush uh, and Laura uh, for their wonderful gift of friendship. Uh, let me thank those who are not with us today and uh, people whom uh, this journey would not have been possible without. My late former uh, Chief of Staff, Paula Nowakowski, and her mother, Tio. My former and first Chief of Staff, Barry Jackson, and his father and late mother, Judy. Uh, two great American families uh, who sacrificed uh, to support me and everything we were trying to achieve. And let me thank uh, my friends and my former colleagues uh, that I've served uh, in this institution with. And uh, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, whether you voted for me or for Speaker or somebody else, uh, it was an honor to serve with you. Uh, let me thank the people of Ohio's 8th Congressional District who sent me to uh, the U.S. House as their representative for some 25 years. You know, I've had a, a few years now to reflect uh, on my time uh, and what it meant to me to work under this dome. Uh, it was the chance to learn from people that I admired, uh, the late Henry Hyde, and a guy named John Dingle. It was a chance uh, uh, to form friendships with uh, people uh, on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers, and many of you are here. Uh, but uh, real friendships and close friendships like that of my friends Saxby Jambliss and Richard Burr and Tom Latham. I remember the day that I was uh, first sworn in and uh, I was really doing well. I had my act together, I had my chin up, uh, I was headed all together and uh, I was up on the rostrum, uh, you know, waiting for the applause to die down and I looked to my left and all of a sudden who do I see? Chambliss, Burr, and Latham, my three best buds. It was over. <laughs> uh, it was a chance to, uh, to change our federal government, first as uh, the part of the Gang 7, uh, to close the House Bank, later with uh, Speaker Gingrich and the contract with America, later uh, with the Pledge to America, and our mantra, where are the jobs? Uh, that provided a governing agenda for uh, my speakership. It was a chance to make law with people like uh, Senator Ted Kennedy and George Miller, as Speaker Pelosi pointed out, two Democrat colleagues, uh, where we were able to work together and find common ground without compromising on our principles. And I have to say, working with the Senator Harry Reid <laughs> for many years uh, was, uh, was an opportunity to, again, work across the aisle to get things done on behalf of the American people. And many of you on both sides of the aisle that I could mention, but I don't want to ruin your career while you're still in office. <laughs> it was even a chance to honor some of my personal heroes, Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, and to welcome a Pope uh, to this capital to address a joint medium Congress for the first time. But I never really wanted this to be about me. You know, the closer I got to, to the speakership, uh, the, I, I became to realize this. I remember the, leaks, the weeks leading up to the 2010 election. Time Magazine wanted me to sit uh, uh, and pose for a cover shot. Well, I was honored, but I declined. Uh, they had the editor call my staff and plead the case, and I declined again. And uh, finally, they sent a photographer to chase me around Ohio on the weekend before the election in 2010. And finally, I grabbed a candid shot of me and put it on the cover. Frankly, it turned out fun. I kind of feel sort of the same way about uh, this portrait today. Uh, it's uh, my image that will be on the wall, uh, but I, it's my hope that when our fellow citizens uh, see this portrait in the speaker's lobby uh, for decades to come, they'll think not about me, but about the things that we stood for uh, during my time here in the Capitol. It doesn't cost anything to be nice. I'd like to think we were able to disagree without being disagreeable. And I'd like to think that we tried to do the right things for the right reasons. And I'd like to think that we served with our priorities in line, 
mindful of our children's future, especially when it comes to the challenge of our nation's debt. Now, sometimes we fall short on these things, but we always try. And it's important that those serving in office keep trying. Now, I believe in an America in which anybody can be anything they want to be. Uh, my life's uh, somewhat proof of that. And I hope that when my portrait hangs in the Capitol, it will not hang as a tribute to me, but to that particularly, particular quality of this great country. We call it the American dream. The American dream is alive. And it's alive because so many have sacrificed to help keep it alive. And that's what I hope we honor today, and I know I do. So in the bottom of my heart, I want to thank uh, each of you uh, for being here today, uh, for being who you are, and, uh, and, uh, and for being here to help me celebrate this great day. God bless you, uh, God bless this great capital, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing as Reverend Patrick Conroy, Chaplain of the United States House of Representatives, delivers the benediction. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that we have been honored to gather in this august place to honor the 53rd Speaker of the People's House. We thank you for all who spoke this day and ask that all might be inspired by the service of Speaker Boehner and all those who work in our nation's capital. May we stand ready to respond as we are able in whatever way we ought as responsible citizens. God bless our speaker, our friend John Boehner. Bless the Congress he so honorably served in, and bless the United States of America. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats for the departure of the official party. On behalf of the speaker,